Hey guys, I am so excited because we have somebody very, very special with us here today. She is one of our country's top pediatric dermatologists. She is also a Stanford professor, Dr. Latanya Benjamin. She has helped us so much personally with dealing with our six-month-old daughter Isabella's eczema issues. And since it is Eczema Awareness Month, we thought it would be so great to let you guys send in some questions and get them answered here today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's amazing to be here. I love, love this opportunity to help educate and just answer questions that your adoring fans have. And let's help some babies. Okay. Yes. Let's help some kids. <laughs> yes. Yes. So this was so important for me to do because um, since Issa was about three weeks old, we've kind of struggled off and on with eczema. And it's been so hard for us to get in contact with a pediatric dermatologist. There aren't that many of you. So um, when we were voicing our concerns to a family friend, she happened to connect us with you. And we are so incredibly lucky um, to have gotten into contact with you because you've just helped so much. So I just really wanted to give you the chance to get on here and just help a lot more people because I think so many moms have the same issues from eczema to um, cradle cap. I mean, these are very, very common concerns, but a lot of us don't have the information or resources to solve them for our kids. So we are just so lucky to have you here today. Let's just jump right in. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so grateful um, to be able to answer these questions because I understand that you're exactly right. There are so, so far and few of us and we have such a wealth of knowledge to offer families. And I'm just grateful to be able to provide care for your beautiful baby. Yes, yes. Thank you. We are so grateful. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in here. First question. My pediatrician recommended hydrocortisone cream for my two-month-old. Is that safe? Absolutely. I have a lot of families that are concerned when they come to me, they're wor worried about steroids. So there's a big steroid phobia out there. I think steroids gets a bad rep, um, rightfully so in the wrong hands. And if it's used improperly, but hydrocortisone, especially 1% is over the counter. It's the absolute mildest uh, steroid cream out there that can begin to help bring relief to our eczema babies. It is absolutely safe. Uh, most steroids, it's a matter of the strength and the location you apply it. Mm -hmm. So for example, I would not recommend steroids around the eyes. That's a delicate location within skin, but really outside of that, it's fair game to use twice a day on um, the rough eczema patches, especially if there's some pink or redness to it. That means that the skin is now inflamed and definitely if it's itchy, it will begin to bring some relief. So absolutely safe. Are steroids the only option for baby eczema? Uh, we have different class of medications, like I mentioned earlier, especially around the eyes. Um, I, you know, rarely if ever will um, prescribe a steroid, even the mildest and gentlest around the eyes. And so we do have classes of medication where there's no steroids, the calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, there's even newer agents um, um, on the market that we are able to prescribe a whole different drug class. Um, that has no steroids. And so the things that we're worried about, you know, um, lighter marks on the skin or thinning the skin or any of those unwanted side effects are really not an issue. Oh, that's great. Next question here. How do I make sure my toddler doesn't get scars when she's older? Oh, I love that question because everyone comes in having had eczema for a period of time with concerns about scars, especially uh, patients with skin of color, when you have that ability to make beautiful pigment, you know, you have olive skin or darker skin. Um, scars are usually what occurs when a child has been extremely itchy and that hasn't been addressed. Um, so I'd say the number one thing is to make sure that um, your doctor is addressing the actual itch in your child's skin so that they're comfortable in their skin. They're no longer itching because when a child goes at it, they're smart. They're going to dig, they're going to dig and try and find that relief. And once it breaks the collagen, there you go, you have a scar or even the hyperpigmentation after for years. And so we're always trying to avoid that. So I think the number one thing is absolutely have management of the itch. And does that include the, the white patches that sometimes form? Is that what you're referring to or actual? That's actual, they can, 
dig in their skin, break the, the, the skin and actually have white spots, dark spots, yeah. or literal scars in their awesome. skin. Um, the white patches you're referring to, it's another condition called pityriasis alba. Um, and that typically occurs on the face and the cheeks of our babies. And it's another sign of dry skin. I see. So oftentimes people are confused or they call it sunspots here in Florida. They're not sure what it is, but once the skin gets too dry, um, they can actually lead to white spots on the skin. I see. So what would you suggest for that? Oh, moisturize. <laughs> moisturize. And I know for us, you suggested the, uh, I'm going to butcher the name again. I'm, I'm already embarrassed, but La Roche-Posay. <laughs> the La Roche-Posay, Lipitor yes. Bomb. The I- Lipitor Balm is a fantastic uh, product. I recommend that in my practice all the time. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic. Do you like it? Did you I it love in? it. Yeah. I love it. I want to buy bottles and bottles of it and start using it for myself as well because it's it's so nice. It's really such a nice um, texture. It really does the job. It keeps right. Isabella moisturized all day long. And yeah, I really love it. You said the exact same thing I say to my families. That specific product has been tested in infants as young as two months of age. And so it it spans the research to adults. So you really can have it as a family product. So you're exactly right. And in this day and age with COVID and we're washing our hands so frequently, you know, it's fantastic for your hands because it's very silking satiny, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. It's different. It it feels so much lighter. It's very silky. And I pay attention to that for our kids um, in hotter climates like California and Florida, because you know, you want a product that will do the job like your aquaphors and your Vaselines, but you can't really send a school uh, or baby to daycare in sticky, yeah. thick, thick kind of ointments and emollients that you wouldn't even be comfortable in yourself exactly. and expect them to have a good day. So I really search high and low for beautiful products that do the job just as well as our ointments, but kind of go on lightweight and feel comfortable. Yes. So next question here should, Oh, this, this is a good one. Cause I, this is a question I asked you too, when we first met, should you bathe babies every day with sensitive skin? Because we hear all different things. My pediatrician told me no once a week, but I noticed that that wasn't working out well. So yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you, that's a fantastic question. A day doesn't go by when I, I don't hear that because it's so confusing. Even what's taught to the pediatrician, it's confusing. There's outdated information, but the skinny is, there's really two answers. If your child is extremely young, like a neonate, um, they're not going outdoors. They're just in the home. According alongside the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AP guidelines, you're welcome to bathe your daughter, your daughter, sorry, so tunnel vision, right? Um, You're welcome to bathe your infant, um, your child every other day. It doesn't have to be daily, you know, like two times a week, three times a week, whatever you as a parent, I always encourage my families to do what feels right for them. Like part of uh, motherhood, part of being a parent is to actually trust your judgment, like what's enough, what's right, what's necessary. Um, But as far as recommendations, yes, a very small infant um, does not need a daily bath. However, um, when a child has eczema, there is benefit um, to bathing them daily. Um, As long as the bath is short, about three, no more than five minutes because you get the benefit of the water moisturizing the skin at the initial touch. Right. Right. So you can do that and moisturize following your bath and, and your, and your golden. Um, the problem is once you stay in any body of water, we're talking bathtubs, swimming pools, the ocean, once you stay in a body of water, more than five minutes, you're going to start losing moisture. And then that's where the problem comes in, where it starts to aggravate eczema skin. So once you go to a doctor or someone that, and you're talking about sensitive eczema skin, it's kind of like, oh, we're afraid of um, bathing, but it's only because if you're in too long, you can start getting extremely dry. Such a great answer. I really, really appreciate that information because Mm -hmm. we were so confused about it too. And um, doing the daily, very short three minute baths for our baby and then moisturizing right after has worked out so well. And it makes a difference. Yeah. And it's really soothing and it's just an enjoyable time too. So we really appreciate that advice. People enjoy that time with their children, yeah. they like to clean them and, and all those types of things. So I encourage my families to have that bath just as yeah. a short, you know? 
okay, how to stop scratching. My daughter is always bleeding from scratching. Will it ever stop? So painful for us to see that as parents. Exactly. And that's why I love managing eczema skin because that's exactly what I want to stop for my families. I want them to be able to sleep and rest and process what they've learned all day and really become comfortable. Right. And so that's a ticket. I think that is the heart of everything. Um, some children are severe enough. Unfortunately, by the time they get to me, they need an oral prescription medication to kind of help that. But again, I'm a conservative doctor. If I can give the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time, just to kind of break that itch cycle, Mm -hmm. then the kids do so much better. And then all the, what I call the lotions and the potions and all the stuff that's been tried and failed and all that begins to start working. Right. Right. But I tell my families um, in my clinic, it's that, you know, your skin is trying to heal with the products, but then they're ripping it. It's trying to heal and they rip it and, you know, and so you can't get very far. Right. So that is my favorite thing to address right off the bat. And that makes a world of difference. Yes. Yes, it does. I think you, you put it really um, in a, in a nice visual way to us that you, eczema is like a fire in their skin and you've got to put that fire out. The most important thing is to just put that fire out first and That's then right. follow up, like you said, with the lotions and the potions, and then it all works together. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I think that's, it's such great information. Thank you. Okay. So next question, tell me how to say this before I ask. Ketoconazole. Ketoconazole. <laughs> Ketoconazole. I love you. Our pediatrician prescribes ketoconazole 2% for our two month old. Doesn't seem to be working. What should we do? Yeah. It's frequent that I see this because ketoconazole is actually an antifungal, like an anti-yeast cream. And oftentimes the babies are misdiagnosed as having a yeast infection. Mm. So they'll go in with rings, round splotches on their body. And naturally, if you haven't seen many cases on the babies, you're going to think it's a fungal infection because that's one of the other common possibilities, right? Right. But I tell my families like, the skin can only do so much. It can only get red. It can only get scaly. It can only get dry. And so a lot of why I studied for, you know, well over, you know, 15 years is that um, it may look the same on the skin, but there's different reasons. And oftentimes it's not the fungal infection. It's what we call numular dermatitis. So numular in Greek means coin shaped. And so it comes out as round rings. And so it's very easily confused um, for a ringworm on the child. And that's why they're given that medication. I see. So if it's not that, and it's what you. Numular. <laughs> Don't quiz me at the end. I, of the I got session. you. I got quiz me. Cause <laughs> <laughs> if it is that, how would you treat that? Right. It's a form of eczema. So okay. the, Right. So it's just a form of eczema that it's oftentimes not recognized very well. And so children get misdiagnosed. And so that's why I love like you and families that can find me. I can, first of all, it's always, let's get the correct diagnosis. So the families understand what's happening and then they can treat properly and accordingly and then problem solved. Right. And so then that's a form of eczema. Um, and you'd manage it depending on the degree, depending on how long it took for them to find me. You know, if it's a mild case, it could be moisture moisturizers, um, but more severe cases usually need a prescription medication alongside it. See, oh, this is super common. I feel like so many kids have this. Are little bumps on the back of arms eczema? What are those little bumps? I feel like <laughs> most kids, babies, even you know, so many adults have those little white bumps in the back of their arms. So yeah, what is that? You gotta love dermatology. So here comes another fun, fun, fun thing to practice saying, right? Yeah. Keratosis pilaris. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll give it a line. All right, all right, let's say KP. And KP. KP, we, we as dermatologists, we know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Keratosis pilaris is a another form for us or another form of sensitive skin. So if you have gentle sensitive skin, Typically on both backs of the arms, um, in each hair follicle, it kind of these little rough bumps. And sometimes, especially if you're um, more fair in complexion, there can be a little pink and redness in the background. Um, But it's very, very common. Most families have it. It's transmitted um, genetically 
from mm. just one parent, not necessarily, but usually. So typically I'll ask the parents, like, do you have these bumps? And mom will be like, oh yeah, I do too. Yeah. So, um, it's typically lifelong on the back of the arms, but interestingly in pediatrics and children, they can get it on their cheeks. I've seen that. Their thighs, even down to their calves is really extensive. So sometimes it really becomes problematic as far as in appearance. And it usually doesn't bother the babies. So it's not eczema. It's just, you know, another form of uh, sensitive skin. It's a skin type, not a rash. It's actually just kind of how genetically they're built. But what's important to know about that condition, you can kind of keep it at bay um, with moisturizing products or gentle exfoliants, because if the skin gets dry in those areas, then it can be more pronounced and um, you know, bothersome. So something that can be very quiet and not bothersome to the child could then become bothersome if they're too dry, they go in the pool, they're not moisturizing. Now that you mentioned this, I think our older daughter, Alessandra, might have a bit of that on, on the backs of her arms and her right. thighs. Um, and sometimes it's mild. It's just, you know, a few scattered bumps and then yeah. some people are a little bit more involved. So yeah. What, what do you suggest that? for it? Um, look for any product that says rough, bumpy skin. They're tailoring oh. the keratosis pilaris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So next question here, how young can a baby get eczema? Mm. My line of work, I can't tell you. I mean, it, sometimes it's almost like near birth. Like I have cases of that, but typically the majority of eczema babies start manifesting the skin changes about month three to five. Right. 90% of our children will develop eczema by age five. So we really see this early in life. And so it's great to have a pediatric dermatologist on board. And so we can quickly help to manage it because if not, you're going through products, your head spinning, you're not sure what to do. You know, you're getting misinformation out there and it's troublesome. It's troublesome. And during that span of time, the child can get worse because then you know, their skin can worsen now become itchy. And then we're going to get into big medicines by the time you find, you know, help. So yeah, that's a fantastic question. They, they can start very, very young. Mm-hmm. So I was also told that um, usually kids grow out of it by the time they turn a year old. Is that true? No, no. <laughs> total false. Miss Buster. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, great I question. think that's important to talk about too, because I think that's a general answer for a lot of pediatricians to, mm-hmm. to give patients. I, I'm not sure why exactly, but um, I think it's important to talk about that because you don't want to give parents false hope too that, oh, this is just going to go away and it's not something that I need to give a lot of attention to because they're going to grow out of it. Well, both answers are kind of right um, in the sense that children, the good news, I I give families hope. I don't want to take it away. They can improve for sure. Like your little baby, she's, we're going to get her better. Okay. She's going to have that forever. So um, the skin can improve. Actually the odds are in her favor, right? Because 75% of the children will improve by teenage years. Now that sounds forever when you have a little baby, like teenage years, like, yeah, but it gets better year after year. And typically the worst is when, you know, they're very young and they're kind of going through it. I see. Um, And before you kind of learn the skills of how to manage it for your child. Right. But um, yeah, not definitely by one year. No, maybe if they have sensitive kind of more just dry skin, not Mm -hmm. more of the genetic or the immunologic part of eczema that can push it to a more severe degree. But if it's just maybe it was starting out as dry skin and you quickly managed it, you could see quick improvement for sure. And controlled by a year, but the actual true atopic dermatitis, which is a medical term, the eczema usually lasts year after year until they finally outgrow it. Um, And so every child is different. So there's no like crystal ball for everyone, but the good news is the majority will outgrow it. And some go on into adulthood, unfortunately, you know, I manage that as well, but the odds are in favor that the kids will outgrow by teenage years. Okay. Okay. So there is hope, don't hope, but don't get false hope that it's by, you know, the first year old and they it's haven't even away. declared themselves yet. Yeah. Right. They the majority by age five. So some kids haven't even started showing you what their eczema is and what it could be. Right. Right. Three year, three year olds, those toddlers, they're going to start showing up. Can we talk a little bit about triggers? What are some possible triggers of eczema? Yeah. So what breaks my heart is when, um, 
moms always take the blame right away, especially breastfed moms. They're, you know, diet restriction. They think triggers are foods and triggers very well could be food. So the top allergens, I would say, if you tested would be shellfish, peanut, Mm -hmm. cow's milk, kind of like the typical offenders. Um, And so they're, food is one trigger. And that could take a whole hour just to kind of digest all that and talk about the science and what we know about that. But there's other triggers that families don't realize. Simple things like heat, right. an eczema baby in the heat. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't release heat as well. They, they, they heat trap. And so they get really uncomfortable and itching their skin, just simple change in seasons. Right. Others, the flip side is that their skin gets more dry when it's winter time, right? So going into now our fall and our winter could be problematic because their skin dries out faster. There's less humidity in the atmosphere. And so then that can trigger their skin. Right. Other triggers can be emotion. I have kids. Well, you can imagine, I know how I am without one night of sleep and my coffee the next day. <laughs> so you get it, right? A busy well, mom. I'm living that life right now. <laughs> 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 it doesn't show, but like, I'm telling you, right. So we know how we feel when we're exhausted and we haven't had that night's sleep. And so these children night after night, they're not sleeping. Right. Um, and so emotions can become a very big trigger. Yes. Um, they, you know, cohabitate, they're sleeping with their parents. Some, many of my families are actually scratching their backs for them to get to oh. sleep and stay asleep. Um, Cause it's so bad. And so when you have that kind of, um, you know, lifestyle and you're so uncomfortable. Um, some of the children learn to scratch yourself. They're, they're just emotional and they, they begin to itch to get attention from their parents or just to have that relief, which draws attention to their parents because the parents want to help. And so yeah. even that can become a vicious cycle. Oh, so wow. there's many, many triggers. And that's something I love to teach my families as I meet them, just usually by the second visit, I can start learning what, what triggered your um, child? Um, What I also enjoy is making that connection for the families when their child has been well for quite some time. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they've got it down pat, they're handling it, the skin is beautiful because we do get them there. And then all of a sudden they explode and they're like, what happened? Like I was doing the same thing, everything was going great. And now we have a flare, what happened? And oftentimes in the young children, it could be just a common cold. Uh, they can catch a cold during the winter months and that triggered their immune system. They got stressed by it. And then here we go. And so wintertime, I see that often and I make the connection for the families because they're usually kind of like, what happened? Where did this come from? Mm -hmm. So every child has different triggers. Some it's playing in the grass and others that wouldn't bother them at all. It's just taking a, you know, hot stroll to Disney world. Right. So um, as I learned the child, then I, I share with the family, what are things to watch? Watch out for to answer one of your earlier questions: How to prevent flaring? Mm-hmm. You know what, what? How do you manage that that flare when it happens? Mm-hmm. Because it actually, it does. So it's really, I mean, it's just all a learning process, and the parents have to be really involved in that too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You said it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Okay. My two month old has dry, flaky skin on her forehead and eyebrow area. Will this resolve on its own? Here's another one. Um, Okay. Ready? <laughs> no, you heard this one. So seborrheic dermatitis, this sounds yes. like a good case of subderm or what we know uh, commonly is, um, you know, infantile cradle cap, right. infantile subderm is cradle cap. So like kind of baby dandruff, some people like to say it that way. And so why I kind of figured out that's what we're talking about is when you have scales and problems in the scalp, the flakes can start falling and start falling and attaching on your eyebrows. So typically when I see a little infant that has involvement behind the ears or in the eyebrows before it can even descend further and have a rash all over the body that looks like eczema, typically we're dealing with kind of cradle cap gone wild. And so we manage that accordingly. Ah. And how, yeah. how do you manage that? Because I Issa also had that too when she right. was. Most pediatricians will start with the brushing and the oil and kind of loosening and soften the scales. But sometimes there's a component of yeast. And I will we'll go back to our ketoconazole, a safe, safe medicine that we may have to add. Um, if they're now kind of those yellow greasy scales, it's a little bit more involved. And then, you know, there's maintenance products too. 
Uh, but for the most part, it's always the degree. Are they scratchy? Are they uncomfortable? There's a lot to kind of weigh in and diagnose because everything in dermatology, there's a spectrum. It's like a mild end and then a more severe end. So we kind of layer on treatments depending on what the child needs at that time. Okay. Um, last question here. My daughter is five years old and has had eczema since she was a baby. She gets it very bad on the back of her hands. What should I use? So I see this often um, in my practice. The babies, we can clear up the skins really, really beautifully, like on the body and the scalp, but then there's trouble areas. And I find that the tops of the hands tend to be problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, They're really stubborn. They usually go at it. I think it's because it's an area that they can get to easily. Um, Babies, as you know, everything, especially when they're teething, hands go to the mouth. And so you're constantly with that saliva breaking down the skin. So um, for that, we may have to step up with a stronger prescriptive because you're having thicker layers of skin that the medicine has to penetrate. Wow. So something that may work extremely well on like tiny little tummies um, may need a little stronger cream for the tops of the hands. Um, I see also in the ankles, you know, if they're wearing shoes and it rubs there. So anytime there's thicker skin, you may have to do a little stronger but just as safe steroid. Um, sometimes you just have to go a little stronger to do the job, but you can still do it extremely safely. I um, but I feel I find in eczema, there are different locations, which brings up a good point. There's different locations on the body that you have to manage differently. So for example, the eyelid, total, total game changer on how you take care of that with you know topical steroids and so forth. Um, the cheeks, the neck, thin skin on the neck, So every location on the body sometimes may have to lend itself to a different form of treatment, uh, especially those stubborn spots. I see. see. Tops of of the hands tend to be a stubborn spot for the little ones. I'm sure. Yeah. Sorry. I had one more personal last question. (laughs) I love your personal (laughs) question. (laughs) You know, I love you. Whatever you, whatever question you have, I'm I'm good with. (laughs) We're really doing this for me. (laughs) (laughs) But we won't tell everyone else that's listening, right? (laughs) I know, yeah. Um, So I I just, I do want to share this. You you already answered this question for me um, during one of our appointments, but I I think it's such great information. Um, The word steroid just sounds so scary. And um, I, I would love for you to kind of just explain why it's not as scary as it sounds. One thing people don't realize is we make steroids every day in our body, right? Um, that's how we wake up cortisol. We have, um, steroids that affect like our, our sex hormones, you know, estrogens and all this stuff building blocks. And so these prescriptions that we give when we say steroids, these are analogous steroids, man-made steroids they are trying to mimic physiologically what we need in our body, that stress response, right? The fight or flight. And so we need, um, therapies that will mimic how we ward off things naturally in our body. So even though it sounds like, oh, it's horrible, um, it gets a bad rep because if people use steroids improperly, yes, you can run into trouble, right? So I have families because I'm practicing in South Florida, they'll go to a different country where, you know, if you go to Canada and Europe and South America, you can get these really strong topical steroids you know, in their local pharmacy or drugstore. And, you know, without knowing that they can start putting on the face and the eyes, they're desperate. I would be too trying to manage my child. And so, yes. And so I think that's where you have different situations where you can get into trouble, but if you're using it under the direction of a board certified pediatric dermatologist, a pediatrician, someone that knows how to use it, the strength and where to apply properly, And for how long, um, you usually don't see these unwanted side effects. You know, there's many FDA approved uh, steroids that we know are safe for babies. Um, We have medications approved as young as two months of age because we know it just works focally on the skin. It doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream and cause all these unwanted, you know, axis suppression and all these like more scientific rigorous things we look for to make sure and ensure that it's safe for our babies. So uh, steroids are a friend. I tell my families, it's like the water that puts out fire yes. it, for the trash, right? Like this is how we do it. Um, and we do it well and we do it safely. 
Um, but you know, what happens is if you bring us a forest fire and then you go to it with a little spoon of water, you're not going to get very far. You're not going to get the help you need. Right. So, um, you know, we have an arsenal of things that we use, whether, you know, I have to be a firefighter one day and bring out the big guns and the hose. And then, you know, sometimes you just need a little dabble, like the hydrocortisone over the counter, and that'll take care of the problem too. But we do have to kind of match the severity with what will do the job. And we want to do it quickly. We don't want these kids suffering, right? And um, I think part of the education is making sure that we're not using suboptimal strength in steroids. We're going too weak, too mild. And then you end up using more steroid over the time, which is exactly what families don't want to do. Right. They don't want to do that. Right. Right. So much of my first meeting with families is to really see how much fear there is around steroids and to talk about it and educate and make sure families feel comfortable because I don't want them to feel like they need to put anything on their baby that they're not comfortable. And even with that information, some families are still they're just not um, they're they're just not comfortable with that. And I respect that. And so we have alternatives. We have natural products um, that can help may not be as help as well may take longer, but there are options. And I always offer that to my families that, you know, want to seek alternative treatments and whatever we're going to do, we're going to do it safe. And we've got to get those results because our babies need it. You know? Yes, they do. Well, thank you so much. We are so incredibly grateful to have had this time with you here today. You are my hero. You are who I want to be when I grow up. You are (laughs) We are just so grateful to you. And personally, we're so grateful because Isabella's skin is is just night and day from our first appointment to now. So thank I'm you. Glad to hear so that. I am so honored to be Isabella's uh, pediatric dermatologist yes. and to be able to share this information to your moms and families that follow you so much. And you're so generous to be able to do this and share this information, thinking beyond your own you know, child and family and really to kind of love on all those people that are following you. Um, So I really thank you for the opportunity to try and help as many people as we can together. So yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And yeah, I I think we talked about it too. Skin can, it's, it's, it's not just an outward appearance thing. It really affects people. So emotionally, both the person affected and, you know, the family member caring for them. So I think the work that you do is, is just so important. So again, Thank you so much. Where can my, where can our viewers follow you? Where can they get in touch with you? Um, Where can they go for more information from you? I appreciate that. Uh, My Instagram handle is Dr. Mommy. So D-R-M-O-M-M-Y dot derm. And I'd be delighted to answer more questions. I think we should do this again. You had so many questions come in from like baby acne to, yes. you know, sky's oh the limit. Um, but if anyone has more questions, um, we're doing this together as far as really trying to spread more awareness during eczema awareness month, uh, you know, on eczema, atopic dermatitis, that's kind of a big push and why we're doing this right now. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions about eczema. So drmommy.derm. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank Absolute you. pleasure. Thank you. Um, and yeah, let's do this again. Let's do this again. This was so great. Thank you again. I know you have a patient right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to head over. All right. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. You too. All right.